Chapter Seven of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Promised Land. There was no thought of submission in Alcatraz at this moment, though never for an instant did he underrate the power of man. To Alcatraz, the Mexican was the type, and Cordova had seemed to unite in himself many powers. Strength like a herd of bulls, endurance greater than the contemptible patience of the burrow, speed like the lightning which winks in the sky one instant and shatters the cottonwood tree the next. Such as he were men, creatures who conquer for the sake of conquest and who torment for the love of pain. His fear equaled his hatred, and his hatred made him shake with fever. The horsemen had vanished but it was not well to trust to mere distance. Had he not heard more than once the gun speaking from the hand of Cordova, and presently the wounded hawk fluttered out of the sky and dropped at the feet of the man. So Alcatraz kept on running. Besides, he rejoiced in the gallop. He was like a boy who leaves his strength untested for several years, and when the crisis comes, finds himself a man. So the red chestnut marveled at the new wells of strength which he was draining as he ran. The power which the Mexican had kept at low tide with a systematic brutality was now developed to the full, very near, and to Alcatraz it seemed exhaustless. He did not stop to look about until two miles of climbing up the steep sides of the eagles had winded him. He had risen above the foothills, and the more laborious slopes of the eagles lifted at angles sheer and more sheer towards the top. But decidedly, he must cross the mountains. On the other side, perhaps, there would be no men. There could be no better time. Already the hollow gorges were beginning to brim with blue-gray shadows, and he would be taking the worst of the climb in the cool of the evening. So Alcatraz gave himself to the climb. It was bitter work. Had he dropped a few miles south across the foothills, he would have found the road to the Jordan Ranch climbing up the eagles with leisurely swinging curves. But the slopes just above him were heartbreaking, and Alcatraz began to realize in an hour that a mountainside from a distance is a far gentler thing than the same slope underfoot. It was the heart of twilight before he came to the middle of his climb, and stepped on to a nearly level shoulder some acres in compass. Here he stood for a moment, while the muscles, cramped from climbing, loosened again, and he looked down at the work he had already accomplished. It was a dizzy fall to the lowlands. The big foothills were mere dimples on the earth, and limitless plain moved east towards darkness. The stallion breathed deep of the pure mountain air, contented. All his old life lay low beneath him, in a thicker air and in a deeper night. He had climbed out of it to a lonely height, perhaps but a free one. The wind coming off the mountain top curled his tail along his flank. He turned and put his head into it, already refreshed for more climbing. There was a strange scent in that wind, a rank, keen odor that would have stopped him instantly had he been wiser in the life of the wilderness. As it was, he trotted on through a skirting of shrubbery, and on the verge of a clearing was stopped by the snarl that rolled out of the ground at his feet. Then he saw a dead deer on the ground, and over it a great tawny creature, one paw lay on the flank of its prey. The bloody muzzle was just above. There is no greater coward than the puma. Ordinarily, she would have hesitated before attacking the grown horse, but the surprise made her desperate. She sprang, even as Alcatraz whirled for flight, and in whirling he saw that there was no escape from the leap of this monster with the yawning teeth. He kicked high and hard, Eleven hundred pounds of seasoned muscle concentrated in the drive. 
The blow would have smashed in the side of a bull. One hoof glanced off, the other struck fair and full between the eyes of the mountain lion. The great cat spun backwards, screeching, but Alcatraz saw no more than the fall. He fled up the mountain, with fear of death lightening his strides, regardless of footing, crashing through underbrush, and came to the end of his hysterical flight at the crest of the slope. There he paused, shaking and weak, but the mountain top was bare of cover. And, scanning it eagerly through the treacherous moonlight, he saw there was no immediate danger. Down the western slopes he saw a fairyland for horses. Far beyond rose a second range nearly as lofty as the peak on which he stood. But in between tumbled rolling ground, a dreamy panorama in the moonshine. One feature was clear, and that was a broad looping of silver among the hills, a river with slender tributaries dodging swiftly down to it from either side. Alcatraz looked with a swelling heart, thinking of the white-hot deserts which he had known all his life. The wind which lifted his mane and cooled his hot body carried up also the delicious fragrance of the evergreens, and it seemed to Alcatraz that he had come in view of a promised land. Surely he had dreamed of it on many a day, in burning, dusty corrals or in oven-like sheds. The descent was far less precipitous than the climb, and far shorter to the plateau. Just where the true mountains broke out into a pleasant medley of foothills, the stallion stopped to rest. He nibbled a few mouthfuls of grass, growing lush, and rank on the edge of the watercourse, waded to the knees in a still pool, and blotted out the star image with the disturbance of his drinking, and then went back onto the hilltop to sleep. It was full day before he rose and started on again, and to keep his strength for the next stage of the journey, he ate busily first on the lee side of a hill where the grass was thickest and tenderest. Between mouthfuls, he raised his head to gaze down on his newfound land. It was a day of clouds, thin sheetings, and dense cumulus masses sweeping on the west wind and breaking against the mountains. Alcatraz could not see the crests over which he had climbed the night before, so thick were those breaking ranks of clouds. But the plateau beneath him was dotted with yellow sunshine, and in the day it filled to the full the promise of the moonlit night. He saw wide stretches of meadow, he saw hills sharp-sided and smoothly rolling, places to climb with labor and places to gallop at ease. He saw streams that promised drink at will. He saw clumps and groves of trees for shelter from sun or storm. All that a horse could will was here, beyond imaginings. Alcatraz lifted his beautiful head and neighed across the lowlands. There was no answer, his kingdom silently awaiting his coming, so he struck out at a sharp pace. The run of the day before, in place of stiffening him, had put him in racing trim, and he went like the wind. He was in playful mood. He danced and shied as each cloud shadow struck him, a dim figure in the shade, but shining red chestnut in the sun patches. On every hand he saw dozens of places where he would have stopped willingly had not more distant beauties lured him on. There were hills whose tops would serve him as watchtowers in time of need. There were meadows of soft soil where the grass grew long and rank, and others where it was a sweeter and finer growth. But both had their places in his diet, and must be remembered so Alcatraz tried to file them away in his mind. But who could remember single jewels in a great treasure? He was like a child chasing butterflies, and continually lured from the pursuit of one to that of another still brighter. So he came, in his kingly progress, to the first blot on the landscape, the first bar, 
the first hindrance. Sinuous and swift curving, as a snake it twisted over the hilltops and dipped across hollows, three streaks of silver light, one above the other, and endless. The ears of Alcatraz flattened. He knew barbed wire fences of old, and he knew they meant man and domination of man. The scars of whip and spur stung him afresh. The old sullen hatred rose in him. Those three elusive lines of light were stronger than he, he knew, just as the frail body of a man contained a mysterious strength far greater than his. He turned his head across the wind and galloped beside the new-strung fence for ten breathless minutes. Then he paused, panting, still running endless before him, and behind was the fence, and now he saw a checking of similar fences across the meadow to his right. More than that, he saw a group of fat cattle browsing, and just beyond were horses in a pasture. Alcatraz slipped backwards and sideways till he was out of sight, and then galloped over the hill until he came to a grove of trees at the top. Here he paused to continue his examination from shelter. The fence was the work of man, the cattle and horses were the possessions of man, and far off to the left, out of a grove of trees, rose the smoke which spoke of the presence of man himself. The chestnut shivered, as though he were shaking cold water off his hide. Then unreasoning fury gripped him, for here was his paradise, his promised land, preempted by the great enemy. He stayed for a long moment gazing, and then turned reluctantly, and fled like one pursued, back by the way he had come. He got beyond the fence in the course of half an hour, but still he kept on. He began to feel that as long as he galloped on land, which was pleasant to him, it would be pleasant to man also. So he kept steadily on his way, leaping the brooks. Into the river he cast himself and swam to the farther shore. There was an instant change beyond that bank. The valley opened like a fan. The handle of it was the green, well-watered plateau into which he had first descended. But now it spread in raw-colored desert, cut up by ragged hills here and there, and extending on either side to mountains purple-blue with distance. With the water dripping from his belly, Alcatraz twinked the farewell glance to the green country behind him and set his face towards the desert. It was not so hard to leave the pleasant meadows. Now he knew they were man-owned, there was a taint in their beauty. And here on the sands of the desert, with only dusty bunch grass to eat and muddy water holes to drink from, he was at least free from the horror of the enemy. He kept on fairly steadily, nibbling in the bunch grass as he went, now trotting a little, now cantering lightly across the stretch barren of forage. So he came, just after noonday, downwind from the scent of horses. His own kind, yet he was worried, for he connected horses inevitably with the thought of man. Nevertheless, he decided to explore, and coming warily over a rise of ground, he saw in the hollow beyond a whole troop of horses without a man in sight. He was too wise to jump to conclusions, but he slipped back from his watch post and ran in a long semicircle about the herd. But having made out that there was no cowpuncher nearby, he came back to his original place of vantage and resumed his observations. A beautiful black stallion wandered upwind from the rest, and another younger horse was on the other side of the herd. Between was a raggedy assembled group of mares old and young, with leggy yearlings, deer-footed colts, and more than one time-worn stallion. It was a motley assembly. The colors ranged from piebald to gray, and there was a great diversity in stature. Presently the black stallion neighed softly, whereat 
the rest of the herd bunched closely together, the mares with the foals on the side, and all heads turning towards the black, who now galloped to a hilltop, surveyed the horizon, and presently dropped his head to graze again. This was a signal to the others. They spread out again carelessly, but Alcatraz was beginning to put two and two together in his thoughts. The two stallions were obviously guards, but what should they be guarding against in the broad light of day except that terrible destroyer who hunts as well as noon as at midnight? Man. Inspiration came to Alcatraz. The difference of color and stature, the unkept manes and tails, the wild eyes were all telling a single story now. These were not the servants to man, and since they were not his servants, they must be enemies, for that was the law of the world. The great enemy dominated, and where he could not dominate, he killed. And the herd feared the same power which Alcatraz feared. Instantly, they became to him brothers and sisters, and he stepped boldly into view. The result was startling. From the hilltop, the black stallion whinnied shrill and short, and in a twinkling, the whole group was in motion, scurrying north. Alcatraz looked in wonder, and saw the black fall in behind the rest, and range across the rear, biting the flanks of older horses, who found it difficult to keep the hot pace. With this accomplished, and when the herd was stolidly compacted before his driving, the black skirted around the whole group, and with a magnificent spurt of running, placed himself in the lead. He kept his place easily, a strong galloping gray mare at his hip, and from time to time tossed his head to the side to take stock of his followers. And so they dipped out of sight beyond the next swell of ground. Alcatraz recovered from his amazement to start in pursuit. This was a mystery worth solving. Moreover, the moment he made sure that these were not man-owned creatures, they had become inexplicably dear to him, and as they disappeared, his heart grew heavy. His running gait carried him quickly in view. They had slackened in their flight a little, but as he hove into sight, again they took the alarm once more, the foals first rushing to the front, and then the whole herd with flying manes and tails blown straight out. It was a goodly sight to Alcatraz. Moreover, his heart leaped strangely, as it always did, when he saw horses in full gallop. Perhaps they were striving to test his speed of foot before they admitted him to their company. In that case, the answer was soon given. He sent his call after them, bidding them watch a real horse run, then overtook them in one dizzy burst of sprinting. His rush carried him not only up to them, but among them. Two or three youngsters swerved aside with frightened snorts, but as he came up behind a laboring mare, she paused in her flight to let drive with both heels. Alcatraz barely escaped the danger with a sidestep light as a dancer's and shortened his gallop. He could not punish the mare for her impudence. Besides, he needed time to rearrange his thoughts. Why should they flee from a companion who intended no harm? It was a great puzzle. In the meantime, keeping easily at the heels of the wild horses, he noticed that they were holding their pace better than any cowponies he had ever seen running. From the oldest mare to the youngest foal, they seemed to have one speed of foot. A neigh from the black leader made the herd scatter on every side like fire in stubble. Alcatraz halted to catch the meaning of this new maneuver and saw the black approaching at a high-stepping trot as one determined to explore a danger but ready to instantly flee if it seemed a serious threat. His gaze was fixed not on Alcatraz, but on the far horizon, where the hills became a blue mist, rolling softly against the sky. He seemed to make up his mind, presently, 
that nothing would follow the chestnut out of the distance, and he began to move about Alcatraz in a rapid gallop, constantly narrowing his circle. Alcatraz turned constantly to meet him, whinnying a friendly greeting, but the black paid not the slightest heed to these overtures. At length he came to a quivering stand twenty yards away, head up, ears back, a very statue of an angry and proud horse. Obviously it was a challenge, but Alcatraz was too happy in his newfound brothers to think of battle. He ducked his head a little and pawed the ground lightly, a horse's age-old manner of expressing amicable intentions. But there was nothing amicable in the black leader. He reared a little bit and came down lightly on his forefeet. His weight gathered on his haunches as though he were preparing to charge. And at this unmistakable evidence of ill will, Alcatraz snorted and grew alert. If it came to fighting, he was more than at home. He was a master. More than one corral gate he had cunningly worked a jar, and more than one flimsy barn wall he had broken down with his leaning shoulder, and more than one fence he had leaped to get at the horses beyond. With anger rising in him, he took stock of the opponent. The black lacked a good inch of his own height, but in substance more than made up for the deficiency. He was a stalwart eight-year-old, muscled like a Hercules, with plenty of bone to stand his weight, and his eyes glittering through the tangle of forelock gave him an air of savage cunning. Decidedly, here was a foeman worthy of his steel, thought Alcatraz. He looked about him. There stood the mares and the horses ranged in a loose semicircle, waiting and watching. Only the colts, ignorant of what was to come, had begun to frolic together or bother their mothers with a savage pretense of battle. Alcatraz saw one solid old bay topple her offspring with a side swing of her head. She wanted an unobstructed view of the fight. His interest in this by-play nearly proved his undoing, for while his head was turned he heard a rushing of hoofs, and barely had time to throw himself to one side as the black flashed by him. Alcatraz turned and reared to beat the insolent stranger into the earth, but he found that the leader was truly different from the sluggish horses of men. A hundred wild battles had taught the black every trick of tooth and heel, and in the thick of the fight he carried his weight with the agility of a cat. Alcatraz had not yet swung himself fairly back on his haunches when the black was upon him the dust flying up behind from the quickness of his turn. Straight at the throat of the chestnut he dived, and his teeth closed on the throat of Alcatraz, just where the neck narrows beneath the jaw. His superior height enabled Alcatraz to rear and fling himself clear. But his throat was bleeding when he landed on all fours, dancing with rage and the sting of his wounds. Yet he refrained from rushing. He had been in too many fights to charge blindly. The black, however, had tasted victory and came again with a snort of eagerness. It was the thing for which Alcatraz had been waiting, and he played a trick which he had learned long before from a cunning old gelding who, on a day, had given him a bitter fight. He pitched back as though he were about to rear to meet the charge but when his forefeet were barely clear of the ground, he rocked down again, whirled, and lashed out with his heels. Had they landed fairly, the battle would have ended in that instant. But the black was cat-footed indeed, and he swerved in time to save his head. Even so, one flashing heel had caught his shoulder and ripped it open like a knife. And they both sprang away, ready for the next clash. The gray mare, who had run so gallantly at the hip of the leader, now approached and stood close by with pricking ears. Alcatraz bared his teeth as he glanced aside at her. No doubt, if he were knocked sprawling, 
she would rush in to help her lord and master finish the enemy. That gave Alcatraz a second problem, to fight the stallion without turning his back on the treacherous mare. Before he could plan his next move, the black was at him again. This time they reared together, met with a clash of teeth and rapid beat of hoofs, and parted on equal terms. Alcatraz eyed his enemy with a fierce respect. His head was dull and ringing with the blows. His shoulder had been slightly cut by a glancing forehoof. Decidedly, he could not meet the brawn of this hardened old warrior on such terms. He had used up one trick, he must find another, and still another, and when the black rushed again, Alcatraz slipped away from the contact and raced off at his matchless gallop. The other pursued a short distance and stopped, sounding his defiance in his triumph. As well follow the wind as the chestnut stranger. Besides, the blood was pouring from a gash in his shoulder, and that foreleg was growing weak. It was well that the battle had ended at this point. But it was not ended. Flight was not in the mind of Alcatraz as he swept away. He ran in dodging circles about the enemy, swerving in and then veering sharply out as the black reared to meet the expected charge. Whatever else was accomplished, he had gained the initiative, and that, plus his lightness of foot, might bring matters to a decisive issue in his favor. Twice he made his rush, twice the black turned and met him with that shower of crushing blows with the forehoofs. But the third time, a feint at one side and a charge at the other took the leader unawares. Fair and true the shoulder of Alcatraz struck him on the side, and the impact flung the black heavily to the earth. The shock had staggered even Alcatraz, but he was at the other like a savage terrier. Thrice he stamped across that struggling body until the black lay motionless with his coat crimson from twenty slashes. Then Alcatraz drew away and neighed his triumph, and in his exaltation he noted that the herd drew close together at his call. Why, he could not imagine, and he had no time to ponder on it, for the black was now struggling to his feet. But there was no fight left in him. He stood dazed with fallen head, and to the challenge of the chestnut he replied by not so much as the pricking of his flagging ears. The gray mare went to him, touched noses with her overlord, and then backed away, shaking her head. Presently she trotted past Alcatraz, flung up her heels within an inch of his head, and then galloped on towards the herd, looking back at the conqueror. O oh, vanity of the weaker sex! O oh, frailty! She had seen her master crushed, and within the minute she was flirting with the conqueror. The herd started off as the gray joined them, and Alcatraz followed, the black leader remaining unmoving, and the blood dripped steadily down his legs. End of chapter 7